Good evening. My name is David Thrash. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician in Montgomery. I've been here since I left UAB in about 1983. And my co-host is uh, Mike Zag. He's a world-famous infectious disease expert in uh, Birmingham at UAB. And uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about what we think is uh, some of the best practices for treating outpatient uh, COVID. There is no state of the art, in my opinion. There are no experts in COVID, in my opinion. But we're going to try to share uh, the uh, knowledge we have after talking with many experts across the United States. But before I do that, I want to thank Mark Jackson and the Medical Association of State of Alabama for helping us bring this message to all our physicians. And uh, with that, I'm going to tell you kind of why we're here. Now, Mike and I started our COVID journey in the uh, middle of February, before it hit Alabama. Uh, I called Mike. He was planning on a family vacation in South Africa, and I was in charge of a, a big convention in Austria. And I asked Mike, I said, Mike, is this going to be a real deal, this, this Chinese virus that we're hearing about? Now, Mike and I had seen this uh, before. Uh, after 9-11, I was on the uh, Homeland Security Commission, um, and uh, we were worried about weaponized smallpox. The CIA had uh, come to us and, and was worried that Al-Qaeda had uh, uh, obtained a smallpox vial from Russia. And they were worried about it maybe being brought to America in uh, uh, canisters, uh, asthma canisters, the little handheld uh, puffers. Uh, Mike and I have uh, seen uh, uh, bird flu. Uh, we've seen uh, H1N1, swine flu, Ebola, uh, SARS, MERS. But they never really got a, a, a foothold in America. And, and I was not sure, and we were not sure if this was going to be the uh, pandemic of the century or just another uh, a scare. So that's how we started this. One month later, on March 11th, my partner, Lisa Williams, saw the first COVID-19 patient in Alabama. Two days later, I saw the first patient that we eventually intubated. Since then, uh, our group has seen over a thousand patients in the hospital, most of which on ventilators, and we're treating hundreds of outpatients of, uh, right now with COVID-19. Early on in the pandemic, our biggest concern was getting a test back within a week. By that time, then we put them in the hospital, we give them oxygen, we give them hydrochloroquine. That's all we had. Our group gave the Plaquenil uh, to the few patient, patients that, that we treated as outpatient, one of my partners took it prophylactically before he started his ICU rotation. And then as we put people in the hospital, we started using different things when remdesivir was uh, approved, convalescent uh, plasma. And then uh, we, they got the breakthrough uh, uh, dexamethasone study. And that was the one thing that we did find that really made a difference. Now, Fortunately and unfortunately, the data from that study has been extrapolated uh, to outpatients. And for the last probably two months, physicians across the state have been treating COVID-19 uh, patients as an outpatient. Steroids, steroids have been great and they've been horrible. We're seeing the patients severely hurt, injured, and in my opinion, we have seen patients uh, die because inappropriate use of steroids. And frankly, that's one of the reasons we're doing this uh, webinar tonight. And so, um, from the beginning, we've had mixed messages. The CDC first told us, wear no mask, intubate early, and uh, don't use steroids. Then they said, wear a mask, intubate late, and uh, use steroids. Now, to be honest with you, our group was using steroids very, very early. We didn't advertise that when the CDC says you're going to go to jail if you use something, uh, and we did, uh, we, were, we were nervous. But we've used steroids since I was at UAB, and our old Dr. Briggs always told me never let anybody die without having a, a trial of steroids. And we did that, and we had modest success on patients on ventilators. So we were relieved when uh, that study came out. Now, uh, my... I, 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 if you would just tell us where we are today in the state of Alabama with these cases after Thanksgiving and what we're looking at. Sure, Dave. Let me uh, share the screen with you. And we're, we're in kind of a tough spot right now, as you can see from this graph. Um, we have had, we had this initial increase into July and we had the mask order from the governor, which was great. And look at what it did. It dropped our cases down. We started getting under control. But something happened between middle of September and the middle of October, and we kind of just, I, maybe we got tired, maybe the public just was fed up with COVID, and our cases now are really through the roof, and it's, it's a little scary. The thing that I think we're all concerned about are hospitalizations. 
This is data as of today. These are data from the state health department. And you can see that our hospitalization numbers have increased. At UAB, we crossed for the first time today, the 200 patient mark in our hospital. A month and a half ago, David, we were at 55 inpatients and we're four times that right now. And the saddest part, the toughest part, and what we all have to brace ourselves for as we go into the Christmas holiday is this projection. This is from Suzanne Judd, who's a world-class epidemiologist in the School of Public Health here. Here's where we are today, right on the 17th, and coming on out in here, and we're gonna see that over the next two weeks, we're headed for trouble. This is the state, and this is Jefferson County on the other side. And I'm just, I, we're just gonna have to batten down the hatches. She believes that this is, the current wave will sort of peak out the first week of January, but that's assuming that Christmas is not a bad time for transmission. And based on Thanksgiving, David, I think we're headed for, for some degree of, of trouble here. So um, the, the bottom line is we got to get ready to treat. And above all, we have to try to keep our patients at home. And that's, as you were saying, that's what this webinar is all about. What can we do as providers in our state to treat our patients and keep them out of the hospital? I agree 100 percent, Mike. Uh, I, we peaked at 186 patients in Montgomery that our group was seeing. I believe it was in August when we peaked. And now we're probably about 145, 150 in the hospital. But today alone, I'm personally treating 82 patients uh, as an outpatient by what I call on my phone. And we'll go over that in, in, a, in a minute, how we do that. But now if we keep in these 82 patients or at least two thirds of them out of the hospital, that's helping the hospitals from being overrun. And that's, uh, like Mike said, this is kind of where we are tonight. We need every doctor in Alabama to understand it's so important that they treat their patients correctly and uh, aggressively keeping them out of the ER. Now, Mike, I, I want to back up a minute and let's talk just a minute about testing. When do we test? Um, when do we isolate? And do you ever need to retest? But before you answer that, tell us about the sabbatical. I, Mike and I talk about every day, but he took a sabbatical for several weeks. Tell us about that, Mike. Yeah, it wasn't a very fun sabbatical. So what, what we're referring to is uh, second week of March, I came back from New York with my son in a car. We drove back for 20 hours, bringing his dog to Birmingham with him. And unbeknownst to either of us, he had COVID and he was pre-symptomatic. So that Thursday, Friday, he didn't really feel bad until the latter part of the ride on Friday. He said, I don't feel so good. We took his temperature, it was elevated. We both looked at each other and said, uh-oh. So we went into isolation in our house. Um, he got sick, uh, I got sick the day after and he cleared his infection very quickly uh, by day five, but for me, um, I stayed kind of okay for about four or five days. And then day six, uh, all hell broke loose. And that evening, I started having chills and fever and shortness of breath and cough. And it was horrible. My oxygen saps would drop to about 90. And it was one of the more scary experiences of my life. And I'll tell you, David, it wasn't so much that I was scared of dying. I mean, I guess I should have been, but I was mostly scared about going to the hospital. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to be put on a ventilator. And I did everything in my power to stay home. And what happened after that, uh, from day six to day 14, the same thing every day. Um, felt good in the morning. I thought I was over it. And then six, seven o'clock at night, boom, it came back like Groundhog Day. And I got to tell you, those, when we relate to patients, here's what they're going through. They're scared, like I was, about what the next 15 minutes is going to bring. I don't know what's going to happen to me over the next hour. And that's what we have to be sensitive to with all of our patients. Fortunately for me, it went away by day 14. I lost some hearing, um, which is a problem. Uh, my sense of smell came back. I have a little bit of deconditioning even now that I think is residual from the infection, but um, it's a bad thing. Nobody wants this. Absolutely. And Mike, I'm pretty sure he was the first uh, uh, infectious disease uh, specialist in probably the world who got this. And uh, I don't know anybody else, but Mike, yeah, you told us when you were tested uh, today, uh, our patients are, are calling uh, uh, the doctors all over Alabama. When do I get tested? I, I was exposed yesterday, so I ran out and got tested today. Uh, and it was negative. What does that mean? Well, let me share the screen. I think it explains it pretty well. So here on this green bar going up is symptom onset. So let's say an exposure occurred back here. 
it's going to take a little while, like about three, four, five days for any virus to be detected. And remember, we're talking about testing for virus, either with an antigen or PCR. For asymptomatic people, try to use the PCR. I know sometimes it's not available, but you're going to have a higher sensitivity of picking cases up with the PCR. Regular nasal swab is fine. You don't have to necessarily do the brain biopsy type nasal pharyngeal, but I think that uh, that'll work. The key thing is right in here, David, it's right in this area where you see um, the peak of the virus in the green line is really about a day before symptoms. And so that's why we have all these super spreaders because they don't have symptoms. They're out, they're maybe not wearing a mask or in a crowded room and they can infect 15, 20, 30 people just in that one event. Once they develop symptoms, then either the antigen test or the PCR will work. Uh, that's what you're gonna do. Anybody who tests positive, you isolate for at least 10 days. And then for those people who were exposed close contacts, you quarantine. That's the term for that. And then you want to go for, again, about 10 days after the time of exposure. That number used to be 14. It's just been cut back to 10. Two other quick things. One is that you'll notice that this green line here, these are that, that persists out four, five, six weeks. So if you kept testing them with a nasal swab, it's going to stay positive. But the key thing on this is this blue line or, or sort of turquoise line in here. And that's the ability of the virus to infect. And notice by about day 10, it's no longer infectious. So about 10 days after symptoms, the general rule of thumb is that somebody's not infectious. But if you were to do a PCR, you get a positive test. So don't do that. Don't do the PCR. It just confuses things. Go by the 10-day rule. You want to go 10 days from symptoms, make sure that the fever is gone, and then you can declare them relatively uninfectious. If they're still having fever, we want to wait till the fever is gone without antiparetics. And then one day after that, you can declare them clear. Everyone should still wear a mask even if they've had it, but that's the general rule of thumb. Antibody don't bother with. It's not a reliable enough test. It will come on later, as you can see through the dotted lines here, but we aren't really going to focus too much on doing uh, antibody tests. Now, Mike, a lot of our patients uh, want to get retested after they've been isolated, treated for 14, uh, 21 days. Uh, what do you tell them when they say, I want to be retested? I tell them there's no reason to. You're good. You're good to go. Forget the test. Right. Okay. And that's a big thing because so many people th think they have to be retested to get back in the world. Mike, tell us a little bit what you do. You do. You have a huge uh, outpatient uh, COVID clinic at UAB and doing a magnificent job there. Tell us a little bit about your strategy. When, when these people call you, uh, what do you what do you tell them, and uh, uh, how do you treat them? Well, our goal, David, is to, like you, is to get folks in early. Uh, they get some symptoms. We want them to get tested as soon as possible. Their tests are not always positive, but they usually are. And so let's say they've got a person with symptoms or day two or three. If they're older, especially, I want to bring them in now. And let me show you why. I'm going to go share my screen again here. Um, this is the big picture of COVID, all right? Symptoms start here on the left-hand side. And then about seven, the first seven to eight days is a viral, is a viremia phase. And then the immune system starts to kick in, and that's the middle phase here. So when the lungs start to get involved, pulmonary symptoms start. The initial stage could be just headache, myalgias, diarrhea, uh, sore throat, loss of smell, runny nose, that type of thing, maybe with no pulmonary symptoms at all, body aches. But by about five, six days, and some people get it earlier, it's, it's variable. But then that's when the respiratory starts with cough, shortness of breath and a sort of non-pyritic vague chest discomfort. I wouldn't, it's not angina and it's not pleurisy. It's just ah, something's in my chest mm -hmm. and the coughing gets bad and that type of thing. Coming back to your question. Nowadays, I want the folks here. Why? Because of treatment. Notice that in this viremia phase, we want to use antivirals. We do not, absolutely do not want to use steroids here because what it will do is it'll interfere with the interferon, the innate immune response that's really driving the virus down. And yeah, you may make their symptoms a little bit better and they'll thank you for that. But the problem is it interferes with the ability of that interferon to do its work. 
And what happens is that those are the folks who then show up on day 10, 11, 12 with worsening shortness of breath, go into the hospital, and they end up a lot of times in the ICU and possibly on a ventilator. That can, a lot of that can be prevented by avoiding steroids in the first seven to eight days. Please don't do that. But in the second phase, it's okay. If somebody's having uh, mild symptoms, we don't use them. If they're moderate and we're kind of worried about them, I like to watch respiratory rate in addition to pulse ox. Somebody's kind of sitting there breathing fast. That's somebody who I've got my eye on. And if it's day eight or nine, I'm going to give them inhaled steroids, some bronchodilator if they have any sense of, of wheezing or if I think the cough might be asthmatic, a component of that. And then I'm going to give systemic steroids at that point. Again, as you said at the beginning, there's no data for this. We're extrapolating from the inpatient service. Let me, let me make one final comment. I want to hear what you do. But what I'm doing and the reason I want folks in early is because in that viremic phase, if they're eligible, which means over 65, and if they're under 65 having a significant comorbid condition, immunosuppressed, I'm going to use a monoclonal antibody. It's a, not exactly a miracle drug, but it has dramatic impact. Problem is you've got to bring them in, get them to an infusion center or an ER where they can sit in for a two to four hour infusion, but it's a one-time thing. It's the same thing that President Trump got when he was sick, same thing Chris Christie got and uh, Ben Carson and others, Rudy Giuliani, I think, got it. So it's, it's a very popular drug, but it works because it's an antiviral. And I'll make one other comment. The monoclonal antibody is against the spike protein. That's precisely how the vaccine works. It creates antibody to the spike protein and it functions as an antiviral. That's the key thing. Um, you know, other supportive care, but I wanna pitch it back to you with this screen up. In other words, what, what are you doing that's similar, different? How are you approaching this? You had 83 people you talked on the phone with today. What'd you do? Well, okay, uh, and you have talked about this and, and, and one major point I want the audience to uh, understand. We don't really care when they tested positive. My first question is, when was your first symptom? You know, frankly, they won't get tested for five days later. I wonder when their first symptom is, okay? And like Mike says, even if, if they I, I put them on oxygen, I still do not give them steroids that first seven days. I will tend to look at them on day eight and start, like Mike said, assessing their symptom. If they feel horrible or... Uh, uh, their oxygen uh, uh, sats are going down, and I make everybody get a nebulizer and a pulse ox day one, okay? And uh, like Mike said, we've got game changers now on these monoclonal bamlamamab and uh, uh, Regeneron are the two we have in Alabama. Uh, they've been in Alabama, I guess, Mike, about maybe three and a half weeks. We did the That's first, right. uh, uh, first uh, 10 here in Montgomery, and I've done, I, I, it's right at 48, maybe pushing 50 now, and one patient uh, I treated was from Birmingham, only one that had to go in the hospital, and he had a spontaneous pneumothorax. Nothing to do with the uh, uh, monoclonal. We may be proving six months that this does not work, okay? I, I, I grant that. It's early, has emergency authorization use. But anecdotal uh, uh, evidence is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I've treated uh, uh, 32 doctors, not all have had these, uh, but several have. And uh, I've treated uh, uh, several 87, 90 year old uh, uh, people. We've kept them out of the hospital. And universally the next day they say, gosh, I feel a lot better. Now I tell them then there are potholes ahead. And I, from day one, I said, you've got a 21 day COVID journey. I'm gonna call you and, and yeah, I'll call it 80 something today, but I don't chit chat. Now I, I'm firm with them day one. I'm gonna be very brief. I want two things. I say, what day are we in your COVID journey? I said, I don't remember it. Don't think I'm stupid. I asked you the same question yesterday, but I don't have any notes. Uh, I make one uh, 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 HMP when I do the initial HMP, I put it in the record and I don't see it again. I call them, I, they have to participate in their care. They tell me what day they're on. And when I get to day seven, I, then I really hone in. How are they feeling? What is the OSET? I ask the OSET uh, uh, oxygen set every day, that and what day we own. And so sometimes I'll put them on oxygen. I've got probably two dozen people on uh, uh, oxygen, one on 10 liters in Silicaga right now. So we'll treat this. The only thing I could do in the hospital is give them more than 10 liters, high flow and put them on a ventilator. When it does appear, by the time they go in the hospital, it's past seven days and it really is not going to work. Seven to 10 days is your probably sweet spot on that. So we're trying to keep them out of the hospital. So that's kind of what I do. Uh, 
I'll tend to start them early on inhaled steroids. Don't know if it works. I get a lot of positive feedback. Sometimes I out uh, albuterol with that. And uh, we'll put them on high dose of, of vitamin D. I use 4,000 uh, uh, international units a day, 220 of uh, zinc sulfate. I put them on a Pepsid and uh, Zyrtec. There's a small study that suggests that helps with a cytokine storm. I give them an adult aspirin. Uh, tell them to don't sit around, walk around, don't exercise, don't get on a uh, uh, exercise bike or anything because the, 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 the cardiac uh, problems, you can have that, but I encourage a full dose aspirin, not knowing if it really works. I do not treat it with Eliquis or uh, anticoagulation at home. Uh, uh, that's we do in the hospital. So that's kind of how I do it. And uh, I talk about it, it's a 21 day journey and the day eight to 14 is typically the heart of the cytokine storm. So I prepare them for that. And, uh, and, and uh, back to the steroids, you're exactly right, Mike. Uh, we see it's so many patients that go to uh, their, their doctors or urgent care and they put on Decadron day one. We've seen people that I, I'm convinced or died from that. Nobody's fault. There's no text, but we can look at. That's why we're doing this webinar today to try to get the best practices as we see it. I mean, like I said, six months from now, we may be totally proven wrong, but this is where we are, Mike. Yeah. Uh, One of the things, David, that I'm hearing a lot, I'm sure you get it, because there's so much in social media and there's so much politicalization. I'm still getting a lot of questions about hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil and ivermectin. Uh, what what are you finding out about that? You didn't mention that as any of your treatments right now. Yes, and and, and Mike and I have talked. I have talked to uh, University of Minnesota, Emory, Tennessee, and I've talked to colleagues in India uh, about uh, ivermectin. I call it the worm pill. And I have got a control study of one that I did. Okay, and my same uh, partner who took the prophylactic Plaquenil. Uh, was convinced that we should be doing this. And we looked, and, and I, I tell you, I don't know if it works. We've been asked a million times. There's a PhD in Duke says, I've kept committing malpractice if everybody is not put on this. I don't know, but my control study of one, my partner went on it three weeks ago and he's now home with COVID. I infused him a few days ago. So it doesn't prevent 100%. So my failure with my control study of one is 100% failure, Mike. What is your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I haven't used it either. I use Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine early, including on myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was back in March when, you know, we, they didn't have any data. And, and there's nothing more desperate than a person with a potentially fatal illness and there's no known treatment. And it's a scary thing. Uh, I went through it with our AIDS patients back, especially in the 80s. I could totally relate to what they were going through then as, as secondarily. I, I experienced that in firsthand here. Um, so, so that's the treatment story. We're gonna, I think we'll focus mostly on outpatient here because that's what most right. docs are doing. Um, uh, we can go back and just sort of talk about uh, any other tricks of the trade that you have that, that you've learned that kind of help you get people through this. Well, one thing I do encourage uh, from day one, you know, they watch their SATs, and particularly when you get below 94, uh, or, or from day one, I, I encourage them to do the self-proning. That unequivocally raises their SATs. Uh, they, they, the patients will tell you that. Uh, I've not been giving them a, 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 a device. I teach them how to do deep breathing exercises. I encourage them to do that. Get up and walk around. Don't exercise for the fear of getting myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, you know, from exercising, but the, uh, stay a little active, but but not too active, and um, that's that, that that's the main thing, uh, uh, Mike. Okay. How about you? Any other tricks? Not not really. It's a lot of reassurance, and it's also I think what you're doing in terms of the phone call is magical uh, for the patient perspective. But when I was going through this, I had a colleague, uh, Chip Schooley, who's a, a well-known ID doc at San Diego, and I didn't ask him to. He just called me every night. He just said, how you doing? And I didn't have much, he didn't have much to offer besides just how you doing. But the fact that he was checking in and the fact that he um, cared enough to call uh, really meant the world to me. And it was, it was sort of, sort of a lift. So uh, the patients may not tell you this, David, but they, they love when you call, I'm sure. Well, they really do. Let me tell you, it's labor intensive. 
guys, you're not going to make a penny. I don't have time to dictate these every day. I don't have time to build. I just said, okay, that's part of, that's why we went to medical school. That's why I'm doing it. I'm not trying to be a hero, but it is so reassuring. These people are scared. Back to the monoclonal. If, when I go into the, uh, the ER at one of the hospitals, I would do it at 7 a.m. because so I don't overload the uh, uh, ER and a pile them in, in one room. Those patients 100% are on time. They're scared. They don't miss. They're scared. When you call them, reassure them. And, and I'm telling them from day one, I said, they're potholes in your COVID journey. You know, I say from day eight to 16, you're going to have potholes. We're going to try to miss those potholes, but you're going to have spikes of fever. Things are going to happen. And, and every day I talk to them about that very briefly. I don't chit chat. It's about a 15 second conversation between hospitals and uh, up to 10 o'clock at night. I, I quit at 10 calling people. Uh, but it, 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 it is important, you know, th this is going to be over in the summer. I have declared the pandemic over by Independence Day, okay? All right, well, let's uh, talk about that. How are we going to get out of this? Well, uh, all the doctors in Alabama, if, if, if they can, can do what they, we had great doctors across the state. Uh, we, we've given them resources, uh, what we think are good ways to treat this. Uh, uh, to treat their patients like this and keep preaching the, the mass, the social distance until Everybody, to, as painful as this is for me, to skip Christmas, New Year's, and Easter. If you do that, you're going to have a great Independence Day, independence from the of, of virus, and it will be over. Everybody who wants a vaccine will be vaccinated by uh, by June, I believe. And speaking of vaccine, Mike, I want to get your Mike. Mike is a world expert on vaccination. He's been studying this since. Uh, the AIDS uh, uh, epidemic many, many years ago. Now, Mike, uh, uh, there's some doctors uh, in, in this town who said that messenger RNA will mess up your DNA. Well, I, I kind of argue with well, some of these people's DNA maybe need to be messed up, but uh, they also say that messenger RNA gets into <laughs> the placenta and messes up the baby and uh, you grow horns. Now, I had my shot yesterday and I had a little sore arm, a little headache last night, and I feel great today. And I haven't grown any horns yet, but uh, the day's young. Mike, you're an expert in this. Tell us your recommendations on vaccination. Let me, let, yeah, thank you, Dave. Let me, um, let me, let's put this into context real quick. We've all been trying to message for the last nine months everything we just said wear a mask, stay at home as much as you can, social distance, avoid large crowds, uh, make sure you're. Don't go around anybody who's not wearing a mask. And we've said this till we're blue in the face and it doesn't work. Yeah. And I'm, some anthropologist is going to study this because you know what? In other countries, it works spectacularly well. It does. Every Asian rim country has fewer cases than the state of Alabama. Yeah. Australia, New Zealand, fewer than the state of Alabama. And so the reason is that they're, they're, they're together. We're a country right now, unfortunately, that's pulled apart. The election didn't help us at all. But yeah. let's, without dwelling on the past, we were, we're in a tough spot. And I want everybody to ask the question, what happens, what would happen to us if the vaccines had failed? What would we be like? What's the next year look like? My answer is, more of the same, only worse. I mean, we're coming out of 2020. I think all of us want to say, good riddance. This was this yeah. is a horrible year. Let's be done with this. But we, 2021, from a from an epidemiologic perspective, was going to be worse. And 20, and I'm not sure it'd be over by 2022. Yeah. So we're in the season of miracles, right? Right. Christmas, Hanukkah. This is a season of miracles. And this is a modern day miracle, David. Here, let me tell you a quick story. So everyone knows Tony Fauci. Uh, he's the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. On January 10th, the Chinese government released the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, COVID-19 virus, and published it. Fauci on the next morning of the 11th gathered the people together at the uh, National Vaccine Research Center, who I work a lot with uh, on AIDS vaccines for 20 plus 30 years or whatever, they came together. And because of work that had been done over two decades on coronaviruses ever since SARS-1, they knew the spike protein was the Achilles heel. They knew it. So they sat down, looked at the sequence, identified this little fragment that coded for the spike protein and designed a vector 
that would produce mRNA with this spike protein in it. And by the next day, two days after the sequence, they had the candidate vaccine that we now know as the Moderna vaccine. Two days. Amazing, that, amazing. That is a miracle, right? It's a miracle. It's like a, it's like the moon launch. It's like everything else. The side effect or the consequence of long-term study is really what we're reaping the benefits on right now. So the, the, a lot of questions at that time. We never had an mRNA vaccine before, ever. It's been used in some animals with some other infections, but mm -hmm. this was a this was a moonshot. So went into animals quickly at the VRC and elsewhere, and whoa, had an immune response. Wow, that's cool. Let's do phase one studies. And they just weren't hastily thrown together. These were extremely well-controlled phase one that had placebo groups right up front. So you could compare not only safety, but you could look at the Im immunogenicity. They found the right dose all in the matter of, of about a month or two. Then they went to phase two to see, okay, we're going to use it in more people. Is this really holding true? And it was, and those papers got published over the summer. And they rapidly went into not just a large phase three, a very large phase three study with 30 to 40,000 people. That's a lot. That's more than we usually get. And it usually takes, say, for flu, a season or two of influenza for a vaccine to be fully evaluated. This was done in three months, again, impeccably. And let me show you what that study showed. I, I, it's almost like you make it up, but it, it isn't. So this is the Pfizer study. And when I'm gonna orient you here, the blue line are the placebo group. The red line is the vaccine group. And what you're looking at here on the y-axis is the is the is the incidence of new cases. So you didn't get a vaccine, you got a placebo. It's predictable, right? It's a line. It's a straight line over a period of about um, four months, 120 days. And then look at this. Once you get the past day 21, that's the inset here. You get to day 21. The effect is kicking in after the first vaccine. So you got your vaccine yesterday. By Monday a week, you will be right here, David, and you will start to be protected. And that will continue, as you see down here, for the next at least four months. You want to get the booster because that just sustains it. But this is a truly a modern-day miracle. And we would be crazy not to take advantage of this. And so fortunately, the government anticipated the possibility that this thing may work, that these vaccines may work. And normally after something like this happens, you've got to scale up production and then you've got to uh, get distribution set up and it could be another year, year and a half. But the NIH working with FDA, but mostly working with all of our government said, all right, we're going to put some money forward and we're going to, help these companies build plants now, uh, back in the summer, that we can start producing this. So if this hit, we'd have product, and that's indeed what's happened. The cold chain that you know about from the Pfizer, it's got to stay at minus 80 or less in transport. That's a challenge, but they had thought it through. They had everything set up. This is Pfizer working with others, and so now they're, they're getting it to us. You got yours yesterday. I get mine Sunday. Um, and yes, we're getting the vaccine. Why? Because it works and because it's safe. Let me show you the safety data real quick. Here's the Pfizer um, study. The Moderna, this is Thursday. We're recording this uh, December 17th. Today, the Moderna vaccine was recommended by the External Advisory Board for approval. It's a carbon copy almost. They're both mRNA. They're both against the spike protein, and they both work equally well, and they have a similar side effect profile. Here's what you see. Let's focus on the, on the Pfizer vaccine first. Local pain, yep, and some redness and swelling. I wouldn't want to take a vaccine that didn't have some degree of pain or swelling. Why? Because that means it's working. Right. The systemic effects here, you see there are some fatigue, myalgias, headache. The chills and fever is relatively few, and especially if you compare it to Shingrix. And the Shingrix vaccine is probably, in general, a little bit more, has a little bit more side effects, about 38% overall versus the Pfizer, but both of them are, are, are more than the flu. 
And this is what you see with a, a saline placebo. So overall, we have been, um, this is a miracle. This truly is. And, you know, people are also asking about long-term effects. We aren't going to know that, but ask yourself this question. How many vaccines do we take that have long-term side effects? They're mostly all in the short term. Even the Guillain-Barre, or there's a few cases of Bell's palsy in the, uh, in the uh, a couple of the vaccine studies, like three. As far as deaths, the Pfizer vaccine had six deaths out of 40 some odd thousand. Four of the deaths were in the placebo group, mm -hmm. two in the vaccine group. So I think we have really an incredible product in our hand. We need to take care of it to get out of this. And as you said, Independence Day will probably be when we will be emancipated from this horrible pandemic locally and nationally. Let's hope that one of the press asked me yesterday after I got my shot, I said, well, Dr. Thrasher, uh, I understand you'll have a sore arm for three days. I said, well, sore arm for three days or three months on the ventilator. You take your choice. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah. now, Mike, you've had, you've had COVID and a lot of our patients have COVID. I'm asking every day, when should I get my vaccine? I've already had it. How long do the antibodies last uh, uh, naturally and when should they get it in your opinion? So I, you're right. I, I went into a research study the third day of my illness and started having blood drawn just so we could study this. And my antibody levels peaked really high in April, a month after I was infected, and they neutralized against the spike protein. Um, they have since waned. Uh, they're not zero. But the rule of thumb is 90 days. Somebody has their illness, onset of symptoms, as you said, 90 days later, after that point, I'd recommend the vaccine. So I'm now uh, almost 10 months, uh, nine months out for my uh, illness. Uh, I'm having my vaccine on Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. So Mike, uh, would you recommend, uh, what would you rec be your recommendation to the doctors across Alabama? What should they tell their patients when their patients ask me, doc, uh, should I get a vaccine? Are you getting a vaccine? I know your answer, but tell them. Absolutely, yes. And I didn't really answer your question. And I know we were kind of, you know, kidding around about the concerns about the RNA, but let me describe why that isn't true, that it messes with your DNA and it doesn't mess with cells or unborn babies or anything like that. What happens is that little fragment of mRNA is put into a lipid nanoparticle. It's new technology. So it's packaged up because if they didn't do that, RNA is very fragile. Uh, it, any, any surface, anything around us has what's called RNAs or enzymes that cleave the hell out of that. And they're very, very um, unstable without protection. So you put it in the lipid nanoparticle and then you, you constitute the vaccine. In the Pfizer case, you have to keep it very cold because if you don't, that starts to, to break down and it won't work. So we gotta make sure the cold chain's there. But once that lipid nanoparticle is injected, it goes into the muscle cell, stays in the cytoplasm, does not it get anywhere near the host DNA, and then it's expressed. And remember back to basic biology, um, the nucleus, the DNA codes for mRNA that then goes to uh, transfer RNA to proteins. And so that's exactly what's happening. You just bypass the production of the mRNA. So it uses the transfer RNA that's in the cytoplasm to produce protein, spike protein, expresses that protein on the surface. The immune system goes, whoa, what's this? comes in, develops an immune response, usually as you can see from the graph, about five to eight days later, and it starts to produce the B cells, large amounts of antibody that get really higher, we find, than the natural infection spike protein antibodies. So it's going to be probably even more protective than a natural infection in that regard. How long it lasts, we don't know. But after a while, that mRNA decomposes, and breaks down inside the cell and it's gone. So there, there isn't much long-term risk. There's, as far as um, preservatives, people with other vaccines have been very worried about uh, thimerosal and some other preservatives. It doesn't have that type of material because it's not a protein product and it doesn't, um, doesn't require that. It's not a live vaccine, so it's not like MMR. So the point is, this is about 
as good a product as we've ever had. And the cool thing for all of us, we now have proof of concept for the first time mm -hmm. that an mRNA vaccine works. And that's glorious news because a lot of diseases that heretofore we haven't been able to create a vaccine for, this is so easy to produce. You find the key region, you put it into these uh, lipid nanoparticles, and you've got a new vaccine, maybe against respiratory syncytia virus, the number one cause of hospitalization of kids mm -hmm. before the age of five with respiratory disease, or maybe better HPV vaccines, maybe dengue fever or, or Zika virus vaccines. All these things become possible. It's, it's really, truly a miraculous time. That's great, Mike. I appreciate that. And do you have any other uh, uh, comments before I kind of close? No, I just thank you. And I thank the Medical Association for this opportunity. I think if I'm to wrap up and I'll let you have the last word, this is an unprecedented pandemic we've lived through. Uh, we haven't seen anything like it in our lifetime. We know about the 1918 influenza pandemic that took a lot of lives. David, this disease has already killed more people in the United States than any war except for World War II, 400,000 people, and the Civil War, 660,000 people. Sadly, those wars took four or five years to complete. And we're at a close range to those wars in 10 months. And it's gonna continue, unfortunately, while, we in this, while we're in this transition between where we are today and the vaccine kicking in, this is when all of us need to really hunker down and do those things. And you're right, it's gonna be sad this Christmas not to participate like we want to, but we'll have next year. And Absolutely. think of the celebration we'll have then. It'll be glorious. We just gotta get through this. And I think if we all work together, we can make it happen. That's exactly right, Mike. Like my good friend, Dr. Glenn Yates, told me, you don't want to be the last soldier to die in the war. So uh, let, let's all uh, work together, keep everybody alive. And if the physicians in Alabama work as hard as they always have done, they can keep those patients out of the hospital. Frankly, I think we can do a better job at home. If they have a good caregiver, then we can give them the hospital. All I have to offer them the hospital is high flow oxygen and a ventilator neither of which are very, are very uh, good. So I want to thank you, Mike, for joining us, joining me tonight. And uh, hopefully uh, this has helped the physicians across Alabama. I really want to thank Mark Jackson and Mark LaGuire who uh, helped make this uh, happen. And uh, God bless you and everyone have a, a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah and a Happy New Year and a happier Independence Day next summer. God bless. <laughs>